Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me. We've talked a lot about population dynamics and understanding regulatory factors and how regulatory factors can affect important population growth mechanisms like reproductive success and survival, mortality rates, things like that. Now we're getting to get to portion that I like to say is the so what portion. So what about that population dynamics? How can we apply that to our management actions? I want to talk about the importance of harvest and deer responses to harvest. I want to talk about that low soil quality issue some more and I also want to get into a really critical part of deer management and that's the social aspect. A lot of our wildlife majors come to the MSU Deer Lab thinking that all they need to understand is the biology of the animals and the habitat and they can become effective deer managers. However, the reality couldn't be further from the truth. If you don't understand the social aspects of people and how they have to be considered in management decisions, then you are going to be unsuccessful as a deer biologist. So we have to talk a little bit about that today, specifically regarding hunter preferences and how those preferences affect the success of a management program. So why is harvest so important in a deer management program? I want to take us back to those three lines that we talked about. And remember, we have the deer population size that grows over time. We have the declining health of the population in response to increasing the size of the population affecting the vegetation. Then we have deer production, which is a combination of numbers of does and the health of those does. And we have a clear pattern of that deer production over time that is optimized about halfway through that population growth curve. Mentioned earlier about actions and reactions being critical. Let's suppose that we apply an action, harvest, to this deer population. We apply enough harvest to decrease the population size or the population density. And we apply that over enough years for the vegetation to respond in a positive way. Considering that time lag that it takes vegetation to respond and then for the animals to actually respond to that improved habitat quality. So there's a time lag to consider here. But if you drop the population size back, you will in fact have a reaction to that harvest. The reaction will be an improved health of the population because after the vegetation responds to the lower density, the vegetation will produce higher quality forage, which in turn improves the health of either the current animals or their offspring. And in that response to the improved health, you will have increased production because you'll have better reproductive success by the fewer does within the population. If you sustain that action and even increase it to further reduce the density and allow additional time for the vegetation to respond and to the animals to respond to the improved vegetation quality, you will in fact further increase the health and production of that deer population. Now this brings in a, a bit of a problem and we'll talk about that in the, the hunter preference section following. But the further you push this back, further you decrease the population size or density, the greater the reproduction, the greater the survival, the greater the net productivity of the population. And so the further you decrease the density, you have to actually increase the harvest to maintain it there. So the actual number of animals that are needed to be removed on an annual basis kind of drives our harvest recommendations. Those harvest recommendations are based on some of these relationships shown in this figure. 
This is a very generalized doe harvest rate effect within a healthy deer herd. Now, a healthy deer herd is one where the females are reproducing at an optimum level because they have good quality habitat. Survival is strong. The fawns being produced are surviving. So this population is healthy in this particular example. And we're going to look at different harvest rates and how they might affect the population size. If you look at the red, the top line on in red, that's the no removal, no harvest. And it shows pretty much what that study in Michigan showed. A dramatic increase in the population over time without harvest. You can see the population increasing from a low, doubling, even tripling in a short 8 to 9 or 10 years time without any removal. If you apply a 10% removal rate of the does every year, you can slow that population increase, but you will not stop it. If you assign a 20% removal, you will slow it further, but you still will not increase the growth of the population. In a healthy deer population, it takes a roughly 33% removal rate of the doe population to maintain it at a stable number. Now, understand, I'm not saying that you need to maintain the deer population at a very low level. I'm talking about deciding on what density you want your deer herd to be at, what health level you want your deer population to be at, and that will determine the net addition into the population on an annual basis. That net addition essentially will determine the removal rate for that population. The greater the addition, the higher the removal rate to maintain it at a stable density. If you drive that population density down to improve the health of the habitat and the health of the deer population, you want to maintain it in that healthy condition. That's why you're driving it down. So in order to maintain it at that healthy level, you need to remove the adequate amount of animals to maintain it there. So the removal rate is really, really important. Now, I want to emphasize, these are not recommended harvest rates. It's impossible to recommend a specific harvest rate for does or bucks for a population in a presentation like this. I have the, the asterisk there in the title, and down at the bottom, the asterisk says, it depends. So much depends on specific property conditions, habitat stage, habitat health, the diversity of the vegetation, the neighbors, what they're doing with their populations. Many, many factors affect the harvest rates required to maintain a deer population in a stable position. Relative predator populations, there are so many things that, that matter. And so there's no such thing as a generalized doe harvest rate recommendation. This figure just shows that to maintain a population in a stable state, it requires consideration of the addition of animals and thus the removal of animals from that population. Another thing I like to emphasize when I talk about deer population management is the buck population. Some properties don't harvest any bucks until they are mature or they meet some specified antler size that I know of properties that only allow harvest of bucks that are 130 or larger Boone and Crockett gross Boone and Crockett score. If you do that type of a harvest plan, you're going to have a lot of these types of animals walking around on your property. This buck does not score 130. He could never be legally harvested on a property that has that regulation. But every year he's going to eat two to three tons of forage because he's going to eat 16 to 20 pounds of forage every day to maintain himself. So population control of the male segment of a population may be very important to consider. If you're in the maximum recreation approach to deer management, 
you're not going to have deer reaching this age. You're going to be shooting them at a very young age, so you don't have to worry about this. You are controlling the male population by harvesting them. But we must harvest in most cases, both males and females. But the question is, how many should we harvest? Well, a harvest rate should equal the net additions to the population that year. And so the net addition to a population is the addition of new animals minus the losses of animals that were in that population. So additions could include fawn recruitment and typically bucks dispersing onto a property from a neighboring area. Losses are going to be associated with age-specific mortality, might be a high rate of fawn mortality, or maybe middle or older age bucks are dying of post-rut associated mortality. Losses could also be related to animals, particularly young males, dispersing off of a property. So you have to understand how many animals should be harvested from a property as a function of the additions of animals within the population and the losses. If you monitor your fawn recruitment, have a good idea of your mortality rates for each age class and your dispersal on and off, you can come up with a pretty good estimate of how many animals to harvest each year. This shows some very old research from back in 1950 up in New York. And this was a property that had for a number of years no hunting. And the first column shows the percentage of females that were pregnant in this area where there was no hunting. Only 57% of the females were pregnant. And the adult females had on average 0.7 fetuses. Then they started harvesting and harvested pretty heavily for several years. Then they sampled and found that 100% of the females were pregnant and those adult females that they sampled had 1.8 fetuses. This is what a great example of compensatory effects. Removing animals with the gun and harvest was compensated for by improved rate of pregnancy and reproductive production measured by fetuses per female compensatory effects now you may remember this roe deer sample the study from 2000 over in europe and we saw how reproductive rates or fawns per adult female declined dramatically as the deer population increased. Well, suppose we were to do the opposite. We were to start hunting this population again, and we took it from 276 deer back down to 81 deer. You would expect after an appropriate time lag for the vegetation to recover, you would expect that the adult females would then be able to start producing two and a half fawns each if you harvested this population and drove the density down, drove the population size down. Here's another example of deer health or deer condition and population density. This is a long-term database from a, a large area here in, in Mississippi and it shows Two things, the doe harvest and starting in 1977, running up through 1989 on the horizontal axis. And on the far left, we show doe harvest, and that's represented in the blue dots. And then fetuses per doe represented by the red dots. Now, to account for that time lag, we actually plotted here the doe harvest one year prior to the year that the fetuses were actually measured in the adult does to allow that time lag to, to take effect, so the vegetation to respond. And in 1977, there was a very low doe harvest on the property. It was a very large property, very low harvest of about 
70 does and fetuses were about one fetus per adult doe. And you can see for four years, the harvest rate of does increased. In 1980, they harvested 230 does. And you can see that the fetuses were up to two per adult doe. So there was a clear relationship between harvest rate one year prior and the reproductive success of the adult doe population the following year. People get tired of harvesting deer. 230 deer is a lot of deer to harvest. So they backed off a couple of years. They went down to 150 and then 100, uh, down to close to 100, maybe 110 for two consecutive years. And look what happened to the reproductive rate. The fetuses per two and a half and older doe. It dropped dramatically. They started back up with the harvest rate and the reproductive success started back up. And you can see a pretty close relationship with harvest rate one year prior and the reproductive success, or in this case, the number of fetuses being produced per adult female. This is an example of removal through harvest, decreasing density, allowing an increase, a compensation, and an increase in reproductive success. Earlier, I talked about that every action produces a reaction on the seesaw. Well, it, when we're talking about reducing a deer population and maintaining it at a lower density or size, it requires pressure to reduce that density. And you could see the left-hand spring is fully extended, and then you apply the pressure or force, F1, you apply that pressure and it pushes the spring down. That's equivalent to a harvest of does and a reduction in the deer density. And you do that the next year, you, even more pressure. It compresses that spring even more. And that's what it takes. Think about the force, the pressure to reduce the population. Now, if you've ever pushed down on a spring, what is it trying to do? It is trying to spring back. And if you relieve that pressure on that spring, it'll spring right back. And if you look back at this graph, shows a study conducted in Louisiana in the early 2000s by a biologist, Dave Moreland, actually. He looked at forage plant response to increased doe harvest. And there's, there's two histograms here. Year one, you see in the light blue, is the harvest rate. And the dark blue represents browse pressure on quality deer forages. And the browse pressure was pretty significant in year one on this property. They harvested 60 deer. The next year, they harvested 70 deer. The browse pressure was still significant. The third year, they increased the doe harvest even more, up to around 105 does. Very heavy. Still, the pressure on quality deer forages didn't respond. It wasn't until the second year of doe harvest at that high rate that we finally see a drop in the browse pressure on quality forages. And even though they dropped the harvest down to 80 in year five, you still see some declining pressure. The pressure on the forages declined because they got to the point where they significantly decreased the deer population from two years of over 100 and then a, a third year with a harvest of 80. That was enough that over, well, close to 300 does being harvested over a three-year period was finally enough to drop the browse pressure on the quality forages. Now, what do you think would happen as you drop the browse pressure? Those plants are going to start growing better, producing more quality browse, which in turn makes the remaining deer healthier. Healthier does are going to do what? they're going to increase their reproductive success. And so they're going to produce more fawns, 
More fawns means more does. More does means you have to keep the harvest pressure up over a sustained amount of time. You can't do it for one or two years and then get tired of it and stop doing it because it's pressure on a spring. You push the spring down and you have to keep that force, that pressure down on the spring to hold it there. Otherwise, it just springs right back up and you end up with an overpopulation again. Think of a spring pushing it down. You have to keep that pressure on it. Here's another example of doe harvest, in this case, two years prior, and yearling buck body weights. Very similar to the, the doe data a few slides ago, looking at the fetuses per adult doe. In this case, it's body weights of yearling bucks related to doe harvest two years prior. In this case, it takes two years because you're affecting the forage production that improves the reproduction. That fawn is produced, and then a year after that, the yearling buck is available to be harvested. And so that's why there's a two-year time lag in these data. Yearling buck body weights took an extra year to respond because of the duration of time for that buck to be produced, raised, and grow to one year of age. Clear relationship here. Harvest rate goes up, body weight goes up, harvest rate goes down, body weight goes down, harvest rate goes up, body weight goes up. Density dependence. Doe harvest as a compensatory mechanism to decrease population size and you have an increased response of reproduction and quality. You have healthier deer because you have healthier vegetation. So what about those low quality soil regions? Here's an example, an aerial photo of a pine plantation in the lower coastal plain of Mississippi. There's probably not a lot of food in that pine plantation. If you decrease the deer density, you're not going to have a compensatory improvement in reproductive success and quality of the bucks. So what do you do? Well, we've done some research, extensive research on habitat management improvement techniques, and that's covered in a different seminar presentation. But let me just say that low quality soil regions require active habitat management to improve the response of the vegetation. You must open up the canopy to allow sunlight to reach the ground, but that in and of itself is not enough of an answer because underneath that canopy, you have low quality vegetation. And that low quality vegetation isn't going to get better just because you open up the canopy. But if you open up the canopy and then remove the low quality plants, potentially using a selective herbicide, or you come in with some prescribed fire to stimulate vegetation response, or maybe even a possible combination of selective herbicide and prescribed fire, you can actually significantly increase the nutritional quality of the habitat in these low quality soil regions. By getting rid of the low quality vegetation that's present, making sunshine available on the ground, and stimulating growth of high quality plants using prescribed fire. So there is a way to fix that problem. And there's always everybody's favorite approach to put in some food plots. And that's okay too. And that may be the only approach you have. And if that's all you can do on your property, put in as much food plot acreage as you can. Put in summer food plots as well as winter food plots get the forage quality increased in those low quality soil regions and you can increase the health of the deer population. Okay, so we understand a lot more about harvest and how it can be applied and how we might need to manage the habitat to improve the health of the deer population. But deer aren't managed in a vacuum. Their population growth is not taking place in a vacuum. They're that's all happening on somebody's property. 
and there are people involved in the management decisions. And so this human component is really, really important to consider in deer management. One of the things I like to talk about is landowner and hunter preferences. It all comes down to what the landowner and hunter is willing to do and wants to do. Seeing deer versus harvesting deer, those are not necessarily fully compatible. This sigmoid growth curve, the S-shaped curve, you've seen that before, maximum sustainable density. If you have a deer population at maximum sustainable density, you're going to see lots and lots of deer on that property when you go hunting. However, those deer are going to be very unhealthy, like the photo of that doe and the fawn with the ribs showing. Under maximum sustainable density, you can't harvest many deer because they're not producing very many deer. However, if you apply a management action such as harvest to drop that density back, or if you improve the habitat significantly to raise the maximum sustainable density significantly through habitat improvement, you're going to have healthier deer Productivity is going to go up, and you're going to have to harvest more deer to maintain that population at that level. You're going from literally not having to harvest any deer at maximum sustainable density to harvesting more and more deer the further you push that density down until you reach that high point in the green productivity curve. I'm not recommending you push it that far, but you need to realize that the further you push the density down, the more deer you will have to harvest. The more harvest you have does two things. It improves the health of the deer. And so a deer is a prey animal. Their job is to eat and survive to produce babies. If healthy deer are being shot at because harvest has to go up, they are not going to be as visible as they were when there was maximum sustainable density with very minimal harvest. So there's going to be an issue with seeing as many deer. You are not going to see as many deer at this mid-range or even up to 80 or 90 percent of maximum sustainable density. And that's going to take an adjustment on the part of the hunters. Hunters don't like to not see deer. I'm a hunter too. I enjoy seeing deer when I go out. But I don't want to see a bunch of deer that are unhealthy. I want to see fewer deer that are very healthy deer. But not everybody is thinking the same way as I am. And so that's a consideration in deer management. I also want to talk about another human component, and that deals with preferences related to how hard do you want to work at deer management. If the deer population is at maximum sustainable density, you're not having to do anything because the deer population and its habitat are doing the work for you. The habitat is limiting growth of the population. And if you want to shoot an occasional deer, fine. It won't matter to the deer population. It won't matter to the habitat to remove a few animals here and there. But again, if you put that work into it to drive the density back, you are going to end up with healthier deer, increased production, and increased harvest effort. And the further you push that density back, the harder it is to maintain it because you are pushing that spring down. Remember that force example I used earlier? You're pushing a spring down with a force and that population density wants to come back because as you push it back, the vegetation is going to improve in quality, the reproductive success is going to improve, and the productivity of the population will improve. And so you're going to have to bump up your harvest effort to deal with the lower deer density where you have increasing productivity within the herd. So it takes a lot of work. Now when you think about work and effort, this next slide deals with something I refer to as landowner hunter return on investment satisfaction relative to 
response of the deer population to management actions. We see on the, the bottom of this graph time and effort invested running from low short amount of time short effort to high a long-term investment over many many years. If you look on the left side in the gold color you see an improvement rate in the population running from low to high and if you look at the right hand side in blue you see return on investment satisfaction rate running from low to high. When you first start a management program there are lots of problems. Let's suppose the, the deer population is at maximum sustainable density. There's some really simple fixes you can do. Start harvesting deer. Start doing some simple management activities on the habitat to improve the nutritional quality of the habitat while you are driving that deer population down. You are going to see significant reactions to those actions and you're going to have significant improvement in the deer population health and the size of antlers and the recruitment rate and the hunters and landowners are going to be very satisfied during this time period but the rate of improvement tends to start leveling off the longer you invest in time and effort in a management program you can fix some really major problems relatively simply but extending those improvements into more fine-tuning of your management program and maintaining it over an extended time period results in a decrease in the improvement rate. You are still seeing improvements, but the rate of improvement is not quite as rapid. And so what happens under this situation over a number of years hunter return on investment satisfaction starts declining because they're getting tired of working so hard. As that population improves in health, it's going to improve in recruitment, which means you have to harvest that many more animals to maintain it. So the work level goes up, satisfaction level may go down depending upon the attitude of the landowner and hunters. And if you continue trying to advance the quality of the habitat and the quality of the deer population, that rate of improvement continues to go up, but at a slower rate. So you're improving things, but it's taking longer and longer, and that satisfaction might continue to decline. So the point here is there's a lot of effort needed to manage a deer population and the longer you do it the more success you have at it the success comes at a cost and that cost is greater in recruitment rates greater survival and it may make your work actually harder and it's not something that you can just do for five years and then drop back you remember what happened in that example from mississippi where the harvest was applied and then they dropped back and the recruitment went down the number of fetuses per doe went down the body weights went down you can't apply a management action expect a reaction and then stop the management action you have to keep the pressure on the spring to maintain the improvement that you are seeing in your deer population and in your deer habitat it takes concerted effort over time and it takes a commitment. So I appreciate the time you've invested in watching and listening to this presentation. Just to summarize the things we've talked about, I went over the three approaches to deer management and you have to decide on an approach that you want to take for your deer management. Each approach has different goals and management intensities. You have to decide about the relative health of your deer and the habitat. Now, regardless of the three approaches, I would argue that the health of the deer and the health of the habitat should be high regardless of 
maximum recreational harvest, quality deer management, or trophy deer management. They should all be conducted such that the deer and habitat are healthy. It's only that fourth option where it's lack of management that you would not have healthy deer. We've talked about population growth and how it's regulated by density dependent regulatory factors, particularly density affecting the quality of the forage supply. We've talked about density independent regulatory factors such as summer heat and rainfall and flooding. And I've explained that in most cases, there will be compensatory effects to management actions. One action produces a response. If you increase harvest pressure and drop the density down, you will have an improvement in the vegetation in most cases, unless it's a very low quality sandy soil. If you have an increase in the quality of the vegetation, you will have an increase in the reproductive success and antler size of the buck population. Specific harvest recommendations cannot be made in a presentation like this. Specific harvest depends totally upon the management circumstances on your property, as well as on the properties surrounding you. Lastly, hunter preferences influence many management decisions.